Hello, welcome. Uh, really excited to tell you about some new announcements. But before we start, I'd just like to welcome all these people who've signed in. Um, lots of new people. Great to welcome people who've been before as well. We've had the most amazing sign up for canine proprioceptive exercises and it's brilliant. So I'd like to say hello, I'm Barbara Holding from K9 HS Courses and I'm delighted to be able to offer this free live event. But it's even more exciting because I've got some great tech that I'm going to be sharing with you in a moment so you can actually follow the page and have access to the page for as long as you wish in a moment. So if this is your first time to one of our events, I'd just like to introduce you a little bit to the Crowdcast Live interactive platform that we use. You can see there's a chat room, um, a chat link that you can do in the bottom right hand corner. And this is where you can share information with each other, connect up because some of you will know each other. It's where you can give us feedback and make, com make some comments. But I'd really ask you not to put your questions there because we'll miss them because the chat rolls up and we can't see them. So if you've got any questions, please put them in ask a question, which is along the bottom taskbar. So you can see where it says ask a question and that timestamps them. So you may see a question that you like, you can upvote it, but we can also timestamp it so you can go back to that question later on if you wish. So next to it on the right is a poll. So the poll is just again, giving you some um, information and it helps us understand what you want. So we have built the resource today because you asked for it. So we're very interactive and we really listen to you. So I'm so excited to share um, the link. The other thing I'd like to say is a huge thank you to Sarah. So Sarah is running the chat. I'm all home alone with all the tech in front of me and I don't see the screen you see. So it's so helpful if you can let me know you can hear me and see me and if the links are working. So I'm just going to pull up a link so thank you, Sarah. Sarah's in wet Cambridgeshire. I'm in wet Norfolk. And so we're counties apart, but we're working together. So underneath the screen, you should now see a green button which says canine HS canine proprioceptive exercise link. If you click on that, you should go to the page that I'm now going to present. So if you can let me know, I know it's a little bit glitchy today's Crowdcast. We're a little bit behind, so there's a delay. But if you can let me know if you can get the link and the link's working fine, you can access and follow on that page, or you can use that link to go to that page whenever you want. So let's start. So we'd really like to, Sarah and I would really like to welcome you to this new style of online CPD. And what we've done is we've actually designed this bite-sized clinical technique to the feedback that we've had on our other bite-sized uh, canine anatomy series that we've been delivering. So you can follow this page by clicking on the green link under the screen and it takes you to this page. It's a public page, you can have access. And on this page are live links, videos, um, illustrations, um, and it's to give you a real understanding of what we believe about sharing and collaborating with you to spread information out there when, you know, for therapists who are all about the dog. So you can bookmark, if you click on bookmark and you're not sure how to do it, that will take you somewhere so you can bookmark this link because the biggest question I get asked after the last bite-sized canine anatomy on cranial tibial muscle was where's the link? The link was there. Um, and if you don't bookmark it, it's really hard to find, but we'll make sure on the replay that we put the link on the YouTube page and you can also have the link on our resources page as well. So just moving the page up. Hopefully you're seeing the screen as I'm seeing it. I'm working a little bit blind, so it's great to know if you're seeing this. So this type of sharing and collaboration, it's essentially a preview of what we've been working on this year. We have created, so here comes the announcement, a new canine bite-sized resource library for people. So this is for people who are really focused as therapists about all about the dog. This is five interactive hubs. We've got 50 hours of approved CPD sitting in the library already. And even better, we've built resources and we're going to add a new resource every fortnight. 
So this page is a little longer than the usual 30 minutes because I wanted to preview and have a sneak preview of a typical resource page in the library. So each one of these pages, it's an individual resource you can access. So that link there will take you to know all about the library if you're interested. And what we will do is the webinar replay um, will be um, uploaded again on this page. So it'll all be in one place. And I just love the way it streamlines it and brings it together. So let's get started. So when we're going to talk about canine proprioceptive exercises, your starting point as a therapist is really to examine your practice ethos. And it's all about your perspective as a canine therapist. So this presentation is not, there's so many things out there about proprioceptive exercises at the moment. It is not about seeing random sequences. It's not about see someone using treat training techniques, balancing dogs on weird and wonderful bits of equipment. This is about the underpinning foundation knowledge that therapists need to create their own unique proprioceptive package for each dog in their professional care. So this is not about training tactics, dog games, which do have some proprioceptive value, but this is for therapists predominantly who are seeing dogs in their clinics and want to create a unique package for each dog in their care to optimize and maximize the impact that they have. So starting with your practice ethos gives you a professional compass. This is about expressing your beliefs, your, pressure, your professional vision, your professional values, and your set of standards that you offer out as a service. It's your anchor and it's your reference point, whether you are a lone practitioner or you're a team. If you're a team, it's your definitely your professional compass point to help keep you guided because there's so much information out there. It's very easy to be distracted and get a bit lost. This is about defining your practice ethos and sending a clear message out, why are you different? What do you offer? What you're not offering is prescriptive exercises that everyone's doing um, on bits of equipment that's out in social media. This is from a, a clinician's viewpoint, how we can optimize and improve a dog's movement. And for that, we need some fundamental facts at our fingertips so we can devise something unique for each dog in our care. So moving on to the proprioceptive system, let's think, what is it? Because it's complicated and people have different bits of information. And so what I want to do is put the jigsaw together and give you all the bits of information in one pot, as it were. So it's the body awareness. It's the sense of position. It's the sense of where your movement is. It's the sense of equilibrium. It can be static and it can also be dynamic, but in the majority of um, canine movement, um, tech, sorry, canine movements and tasks or uh, functional abilities, it's a combination of the both. So think of toileting, you've got static and dynamic elements within it to be able to perform that complex task. So there's two levels, and this is key. We've got a conscious, which is your voluntary part of your proprioception, and we've got an unconscious level, which is your involuntary. Now, when you look at the literature, when you look at a lot of the documentation, they're going to tell you it's not possible to get dogs to actively engage with you. I dispute that. We've been doing it for 25 years and we want to share some of the techniques that we're using. But if we explain the fundamentals we've built these concepts on um, and then you can go from there and, and create your own um, packages for the dogs you see. So it doesn't matter if they're elderly dogs, rehabilitation dogs, athletic dogs, the same concept applies, but you need to be able to make it unique to the dog. So the canine proprioceptive system, so a lot of people get a bit confused about that. The canine proprioceptive system is basically interlinked components. Like you have a cardiovascular system, you've got the heart, the lungs, the arteries, the veins, and other components. The proprioceptive system is a number of interlinked components that build this functional system, which is key to how dogs move. And we've got Professor Alexander, he's no longer with us, unfortunately, um, a Scottish gentleman, and his lifetime published work was very clear that animal locomotion is the product of two things, the proprioception and muscles, so your muscle power. So when you're looking at canine movements that you want to optimize, 
we've got to remember movement is not a discrete thing that happens at one joint joint it doesn't happen at a muscle not a group of muscles it's a complex sequence that's directed by the command center and the command center is your central nervous system so that orchestrates all our movements and it orchestrates all the dog's movements but there's a huge difference between humans and dogs and i want to clarify this because what i see out there on social media there's a lot of mix up where we've got some human techniques and canine techniques and equine techniques it needs to be species specific and i'm going to explain why so think about the activities that the dogs do running jumping toileting rising after rest getting in and out of the car all of these are a directed complex sequence pattern that the central nervous system directs. Muscles do not switch themselves on and off by themselves. They are told what to do by the central nervous system. And what we do know is that therapists can positively impact the dog's natural balance stance and natural balance motion and their functional activities. And we do this by selecting and utilizing a range of proprioceptive and rich techniques, and they need to be relevant to the canine biomechanical design. So what works for one species will not work as well for another species because they've got different biomechanical designs. So the proprioceptive system links directly with the dog's biomechanical design as well. And this will lead to improved and more efficient motor patterns and this will then improve the dog's lives and improve their owner's lives. So my first clinical tip, so I do like to put some clinical tips in there for you to have a think about. There are so many different techniques out there. There's lots on social media, you'll see lots of other people using them. I want you to really carefully explore and examine why you would do that to the dog, okay? So really look at the why of your choice. Because there's so many different techniques, they're all gonna have different value proprioceptively. So for a small amount of time you see the dog within the week, you want to optimize the value of your proprioceptive interaction with the dog to improve their movement. And the key is always rate it, relate it directly to the canine beh behavior that you see in your clinic and to scientific facts. Don't do it just because somebody else tells you it's a good thing to do or that you've seen someone else doing it. Really look and explore. So we don't want well-intentioned techniques that aren't gonna help the dog being used in therapy. So it's about working with the dog and working with their consent. And this is conscious mediated sequencing. And I'm gonna explain what that means as we go through, because if you get that, the sky's the limit. You will just get the most dramatic improvement in your dog's movement so quickly. So the one shots, I was asked um, recently, what are the one shots? So the one shot are a sequence of videos. We've got lots of them, we're building them and they're all going into the library. And this is in one shot, so there's no editing. You see the real story of a presentation of a topic. And so within this one shot, which I'm not going to, to click on, you can come back to it and have a look. It's five minutes and it's telling you about the canine proprioceptive system. And it's kind of highlighting some of the points we're going to cover and have covered already. So when I talked about the cardiovascular system, the cardiovascular system in the dog, there's the heart, the lungs, the arteries, the veins, other components as well. Let's think about the canine proprioceptive system. So we're gonna look at the different components. The first component to think about as a therapist is the proprioceptors themselves. And what they are, they're receptors that pick up, like satellite dishes, pick up information, and they throw that information towards the central nervous system. So think of them relaying that sensory information along information tracks that go to the central nervous system. And they are located in so many different areas. So knowing the location of them is hugely advantageous to you. And there's also so many different kinds of sensory receptors and proprioceptors. So understanding how to trigger them off because we can hotwire this system as therapists, it's awesome. So understanding where they are. Now, if you want that extra information about what are the proprioceptors, where are they located, how can we trigger them off, that's all gonna go in the library with this presentation. So we add more into our library resources, but this is an outline for you today. So the clinical tip is really here, therapists who have 
an advanced knowledge of the type and location of these receptors, these proprioceptors, these mechanoreceptors, they can target and positively influence the information quality. So therefore we can activate the proprioceptive system. And this in turn is gonna improve the dog's movement. So a key thing for you to understand is the proprioceptive system in the dog, which is a hugely automated mammal, is not on all the time, it's on standby. Whereas in humans, it's on for a huge amount of the time. Whereas in dogs, it's on when you switch it on, when you bring it from standby onto being present. So this is about engaging with the dogs in a calm, focused way, because we want their behaviors to actively, consciously mediate and work with the therapist. So clinical tip, really big one here, really think about it. So those proprioceptors transport the information, the incoming information along the afferent pathways. And these are the incoming information and there's hundreds of thousands of pathways coming into the central nervous system. Lots more than the efferent pathways, which are the ones that go from the computer to the muscles of the end organ and tell it what to do, all in a split second. So it's absolutely amazing. So your central nervous system I want you to think of that as your main laptop. So your main laptop that has a lot of information coming into it, and you may go on um, shopping on a site maybe to get some dog leads, some dog harnesses, some Y-shaped harnesses, um, because you're gonna use them as a therapy tool, not as a tool to control dog's movement, but as a tool to relay information to their proprioceptive system. So you're using something familiar in a very different way. So, the central nervous system, the laptop, is beyond just the laptop in the dog. They've also got a huge number of mini computers, and these are your CPGs. And CPGs, they're either central patterning generators, or you may know them as um, central processing generators, depending when you learned about them. These are like little biological neural computers, like, like your phone related to your device, to your laptop. And in the dogs, they have a huge number in their thoracic and lumbar spine, whereas in humans, we only have a few. So this is already telling you the design features, neuroanatomy wise of the dog is very different to the human. Um, they use different pathways, which we're going to discuss next, which is really important when you're thinking about what proprioceptive exercise you're going to use. We don't want to be using training tactics, dog games. We don't want to be using things that are learned behaviors because that's the type of movement humans use. Dogs don't use that predominantly. They use rhythmic motor patterns like swimming and walking and trotting. And in the dog, these are generated by the CPGs, not so in humans. So the efferent pathways, the efferent pathways are the information from the computer, the central nervous system, so your main laptop linked to your mini computers. And these are gonna take the signals from the central nervous system to the end organ. Now, what's really interesting is that huge amount of incoming information up the afferent pathways, the majority of that in the dog is stored. It's stored in the memory banks. A very small amount is processed, analyzed, and actually actioned. That's really, really significant for the choices that you're going to make. So dogs and humans, they use different motor pathways to, trans to transmit these really important bits of information which organizes the movement. So it's going down the pathway from the central nervous system to the muscles to tell them what to do all in a split second. So my favorite analogy I'm gonna use is one about roads to help you with this, because this is sometimes lost when people are making choices about their proprioceptive exercises for the dogs in their care. The fact is dogs mainly use their extra pyramidal pathway. So there's two roads. There's a main road, like the main A road, that's in the dog, that's the extra pyramidal pathway. And they use this day to day to organize their innate natural balance stance and motion. Whereas humans predominantly use another motorway. They predominantly use the pyramidal pathway because we have different types of movement than dogs use. So think about what you've done today. Think about spreading your toast, eating your toast, I'm using cutlery, um, maybe doing up a button, shampooing your hair, putting on your earrings. Um, you know, humans have 
millions of sequences, but they use a different type of movement. They use a movement which we've got in one of our one shots to help you with this point. They use movements that are learned behaviors. Dogs don't. Dogs predominantly innately move in natural balance. So if you can, as a therapist, access their extra pyramidal pathway with your proprioceptive exercises, rather than using any kind of learned behaviors. So just going down the useful analogy, I really want you to think about what species are you working with? If you work on multiple species, separate your techniques. So dogs are a quadruped. They are digigrade. They stand on the balls of their toes. If you were a human, go on the balls of your toes. That's where they stand. Humans are biped, okay? They're plantigrade. Their heel is on the ground. In the dog, the heel is the hock and it's up in the air, okay? We have different foot and paw balance. We have different neuroanatomy. We have different CPG arrangements. So, and you've got to relate your techniques, your exercises to the type of movement you're targeting. So a general proprioceptive kind of exercise where maybe you're doing some kind of um, work is fine for home programs for owners, for dog trainers, you know, if you're having fun with your dog. But if you're doing it from a therapeutic viewpoint and you want to improve movement significantly, we want to relate directly into the type of movement we're targeting for that species. So don't be tempted to use human techniques on a dog. They won't work as well. So the analogy that I was talking about, I want you to think about the dogs. Their main A road is the extra pyramidal pathway. This is the route that they use every day for all their movement activities that you see. Their minor road, their B road, the one that they learn to use is a background for them, is not as significant as their pyramidal pathway. It's secondary to the A road. The examples for that, are if you teach a dog to sit up and beg, if you do a training tactic like a down to command, so you're using a very small amount of their efferent pathways, their motor pathways to their muscles. It's not as significant. It doesn't have as much proprioceptive value. So training tr tricks, training tactics, dog games, these are learned canine patterns. They're organized through their minor lesser B road, it's secondary to their primary innate natural balance motions, stance, postures, and functional activities. It's a key fact. So really focus on your exercises. Why are you choosing this exercise to do it? Make sure it fits the biomechanical design of the dog. Make sure it fits the proprioceptive system of the dog. And make sure you're working with the dog, acknowledging their behaviors in your clinic, building a professional bond of calm focus so that they can actively consciously mediate and follow your direction. These are hugely proprioceptively enriched techniques to use. So in humans, it's completely different because we use different types of movement. So the human main A road is the pyramidal pathway, whereas in the, the dog, that's the minor pathway. And we use this for millions of our sequences um, all the time. So their minor road, so our, our minor road in humans is the extra pyramidal pathway, and that's for stuff we don't have to think about. So don't use a human technique on a dog, you won't get the best results. So these physiological facts are going to influence the proprioceptive system and the choices you make of the exercises you're going to engage with. So you require specific canine techniques. So this is a mind map and you can pour over this and have a look at it. I'd like to thank Bernadette Kirby. She's in the audience this evening. I really appreciate um, Bernadette. She trained at Canine HS and she completed her level five advanced canine hydrotherapy. And this is something she produced as part of that. It's an excellent mind map. So some of this information might be quite tricky for some people when it's scripted. So you could create your own mind map. And, you know, or a spider diagram to get this information into your brain so you can access it clearly when you're choosing the kind of proprioceptive exercise you're going to do with the dog from a therapist's viewpoint. So the key point here is dogs innate movement sequences are not learned behaviors. They predominantly have an innate movement pattern they are programmed with and they're automated from a spinal level from those CPGs. So they don't have to play the violin, learn to dress, use cutlery, drive, you know, learn to write. 
So make sure you're targeting the type of movement you wish to rehabilitate. And I can say this as a human physiotherapist of 40 years and as a canine physiotherapist and advanced hydrotherapist of 25 years, please keep it separate to get the best results. And it really comes back to your practice ethos. What are you about? So again, when you're looking at the proprioceptors that you're targeting, our practice ethos at Canine NHS, I'm really happy to share with you. We work with the dog. We have their act, we have their conscious consent. We don't do techniques to a dog. And we would never opt to use a painful treatment technique, like putting something underneath the paw so they don't load it, or hobbling a dog. We work with the dog actively using proprioceptive enriched movement techniques, and we get the most profound results within the session. And this is what we want to share with you. And I know loads of you are doing it out there, but it's just to realize, be brave, be bold, figure out the why, don't be influenced by social media if it, you know innately that's not really how you practice. Doing movement shaping or um, motivated treatment, um, off wobble boards, wobble cushions, hedgehogs are really secondary to working with the dog with these small, consciously mediated movements that are rhythmical and slow and basically hook into the CPGs. So this one shot video, it's about three minutes long and it's about the different types of canine movements. So I thought that might be useful for you to really think about what are you targeting as a therapist? So my next clinical tip is ensure you've established the type of movement pattern that you wish to rehabilitate or improve. So using canine movement enrichment techniques achieves the best results for the dogs in your professional care because you're targeting the appropriate part of their proprioceptive system and efferent motor pathways. And you're going to work within their canine biomechanical design. And we're going to talk about that now. So canine biomechanics, most exciting topic ever. Dogs are a quadruped. They have four legs for two reasons. It's to support the dog against the force of gravity. So we're key about really facilitating our anti-gravity muscle sequences. The focus is always going to be on your extensor patterns, not your flexor patterns. They've also got four legs to provide acceleration. Now, the dog is designed biomechanically and through its anatomy, through the synovial joint placement, to move forward in the sagittal plane. So when dogs come running, they come running towards you. They don't run backwards. So moving backwards is proprioceptively enriched, yes, but it works outside the canine biomechanical design. And this is such an important point. The facts are, if you work outside the biomechanical design of a model, of any model, you are going to challenge and put excessive forces through structures. We are seeing more and more caudal cruciate ligament issues, and we are seeing more and more dogs walk backwards. So let's really focus on making our techniques that we choose work with the dog the dog can maneuver backwards but when it comes running or chases it goes forwards. so work within that structure and so then our forelimbs and our hind limbs even though they're four legs have different functions so the hind limbs are about generating the power they've got the most amazing coupling at the sacroiliac joint where the pelvic limb or the hind limb attaches to the spine and this is where they can then transmit the power from the muscles up through the pelvic limbs, forward through the spine and move the dog forward. So the forelimbs are predominantly about shock absorbing and breaking because they are not attached with a strong coupling. So you really need to know about the sacroiliac joint with the hip joint and understanding how the coupling there on the hind limbs works to get the power forwards because we need muscle power and we need to target the muscle power groups, not just any muscles. And so the forelimbs are attached through this huge thoracic sling of muscle, which is the most awesome design for shock absorbing and breaking predominantly. Pulling is a weaker action than pushing. So there is some pulling action in there, but when it's out of balance, when they're moving out of balance because of injury or a design fault, poor confirmation or um, some kind of underlying condition, or they're just a very highly motivated dog and they pull, pull, pull on their leads, we need the dogs to move in their natural balance motion. And that's what therapists are all about. So the natural balance stance is going to be 60% through the forelimbs, 40% through the hindquarters. Obviously, this is gonna change the moment the head moves. This is a natural balance stance and in the gait pattern. 
And it's going to definitely alter with the dog's biomechanical um, design it's got and with the behaviors in your clinic. Um, and it's going to alter with what you ask it to do. So moving a dog in natural balance motion is not about having a, a motivated sequence driven from the mouth, driven from the nose, feeding the dog. It's about the dog moving with your guidance in balance to get the optimum results. So therapists who choose to work within the canine biomechanical design constraints, this is about being safe. If you work outside the biomechanical design and ask the dog to do things it's not designed to do, you're putting excessive forces through particular structures. The dog is designed to move on four limbs. If you take two limbs out of the equation and ask them to move on the hind limbs and fix the four limbs, you're gonna have problems. You're gonna have problems within their lumbar sacral junction because the dog has to accommodate to try and move like a biped and it's not designed to do that. If you ask the dog to walk backwards and you train them to do that, you are working outside the biomechanical design. You are going to have a much higher incident of injury. So this is where it comes back to your practice ethos. What are you all about? So we're about working with the dog, working within the biomechanical design. We don't want to put excessive forces through the structures and working with them behaviorally as well in a positive, meaningful and calm way. We want them to find their calm status where they're confident in what we're doing. So they work with us and consciously mediate and decide to follow our guidelines because if they do that, it's hugely proprioceptively enriching for the dog because their proprioceptive system will switch on because it's on standby most of the time. Definitely off lead, it's on standby. On the lead, it's coming online. But we want in a small time to make a huge imprint onto that system. So when you've got abnormal loading due to underlying problems and conditions or an injury, pathology, um, this is going to result in pain or discomfort. So the dog is going to innately alter its efficient motor patterning and it's going to have an inefficient loading patterning, this secondary patterning. And, and as therapists, we spend a lot of time, you know, facilitating that normal, efficient motor pattern. Um, because unfortunately, it may in the short term help the dog move around, but we know in the long term, we're going to get further movement dysfunction. So there's one question at the moment. I'm just going to take a breath. We've got a poll. So please do go down to the poll. Have a look. Are you wanting to know more about clinical treatment techniques? Are you wanting to know more about canine functional anatomy? So it's so important as therapists, we know when in that sequence of events, that particular muscle comes online because muscles don't work all the time for the whole sequence. So that's what we put in our bite-sized canine anatomy series, really helping you explore the muscles and have that deep understanding of their key actions and how they interlink and integrate with each other. So linking your biomechanics to your proprioception, um, we really want to remember that the command center for your canine movement sequences is the proprioceptive system. So let's know all about it. We need to activate it because it's on standby the majority of the time because the dog is automated. So we want the dog to be focused in a calm manner, that calm status where they're listening to us confidently following our direction. They actively engage and they're responding to the therapist's movement guidance. This is not about training a dog to heal using hand signals, using verbal signals. This is about working with the dog using your innate body posturing and facial posturing and tensioning techniques with the dog, using their communication system with them. So we always need to set the dog up behaviorally to achieve. So there's some misinformation out there. People are, are challenging the proprioceptive system. What they're doing is over challenging the dog. If you over challenge the dog, the behaviors will change from that calm, focused, listening to you status into fooling around, messing around, being evasive, being over enthusiastic, freezing, going to flight, fright, just being stoic, going to shut down. We don't want the dog's behaviors to move into that place. We want them to be calm and focused with us. What happens is this will change their muscle tone. This will change their active conscious mediation. This will lower the value of the proprioceptive um, exercise you're using massively. So we want to give them choices. We want to set our dog up to achieve. We want to challenge the proprioceptive system, but we never want to over challenge the dog. 
okay so it isn't about building complex obstacle courses or mountains of wobble boards or cushions there is a reason we have not used a peanut wobble cushion wobble board hedgehog so we've never used a surfboard we have never use any of those things because they're so secondary in proprioceptive value and the dogs don't enjoy that experience um, across the board so you've got to think about the breed biology as well looking at a course and they've got an amazingly trained dog that's doing all these amazing twisty turning movements through legs and under your legs they are training tactics and i'm talking from a therapist viewpoint we don't use those so canine behavior and movement they're totally interlinked they cannot be separated and normal motion for one breed is abnormal for another so think of a Shih Tzu or a Lhasa Apso moving or a Basset Hound, they have a lovely rolling gait, is absolutely normal for that breed. But for another breed, that would be an abnormal movement. So we have huge conformational differences. In fact, we've got more differences in head shape in the dog than any other mammal on the planet. It's just phenomenal. So of course, we need a whole range of proprioceptive exercises. We can select and choose, and it has to map in to the breed biology and the breed personality and temperament of that individual dog. So one German Shepherd is not gonna be the same as another German Shepherd. So this is where we've got to understand the breed biology and the confirmation challenges for that dog and how to work with them in their own innate balance for that breed. So layered into, it's very complex. This is the jigsaw and we're putting the jigsaw pieces together, layering into that complex situation we need to have a sound knowledge and understanding of canine behaviors in the therapeutic setting. I am not a behavioralist looking at behavior at home or in the park, but within the clinical context, I need to understand the signaling of the dog and how to, con how to communicate using the dog's communication system, not human, through training tactics or through signs, signals. We need to use our own body posturing and our own facial expressions and use rhythmical, engaged techniques that hook into the CPGs of the dog. And clinic enrichment techniques, these are transformational, they're easy to introduce, they're easy to share with your owner. And if you understand these, you can redesign your layout of your um, setting, whether it's visiting a home visit or whether it's within a clinical setting, to seriously improve the dog's movement before you've even put your hands on the dog. So we've got to think about significant variation in breed biology. We've got to think about our treatment selection is going to be influenced by each individual dog and it's gonna alter from session to session. So doing kind of repetition of prescriptive exercises has a very low proprioceptive value. Whereas if you create and devise an individual program that you are going to tweak and alter as you go along. And that does not make, mean making it more complex. It's about always setting the dog up to achieve and working with the dog as they present with you in the clinic. So this one shot video, it's a shorter video. It's about four minutes and this is about canine biomechanics. And I was really hoping that that might um, help as well, just reinforce this message. So let's look at the exercises. This is what it's all about. So why do we have to use them? Well. If you want to improve movement, whether it's an elderly dog losing their back end, whether it's rehabilitating um, a case uh, that's um, a neuro neurological case or an orthopedic case, whether it's imp improving movement performance in an athletic dog or a working dog, by using these canine proprioceptive exercises on land and in water, so as a land-based therapist or a water-based therapist, a hydrotherapist, veterinary physiotherapist working in both, you know, using them as part of your movement techniques will lead to improved quality of life for the dog in your care. Whatever their age, whatever their breed, sex, coat, you know, underlying hip, um, health issues, injuries, or fitness challenge. But it's understanding which ones to use because well-intentioned general proprioceptive exercises, you know, need to be safe we must make sure they fit the dog that we are working with. And we do that by doing our individual assessment of the dog and um, from that information, setting our SMART goals, our SMART goal setting, which we'll talk about in a moment. So which exercise is best? 
Canine movement enrichment techniques concentrate on accessing that main A road in the dog. They have a hugely, highly valuable proprioceptive um, credit for the dog. Think of it that way. So that natural balance motion and functional activities, it's their everyday movement. They use day in, day out, most of the day. Small parts of that day will be training techniques, dog games to help them become confident, to help their behaviors, to help them bond with you. I'm not talking about those, those techniques. I'm not talking about um, using those techniques. I'm talking from a therapist's point of view where we want to access and use the main A road type of movement. So optimizing their natural balance stance, and this is not stacking them for show dogs, this is about finding their natural balance stance for each dog, for optimizing their natural balance motion and their functional activities by breaking it down, chunking it down, and working on key components of that sequence is going to hugely improve the quality of life of the dog. And, and I believe they're gonna be a happy and healthy dog and I believe that if they're happy and healthy, their owners are really happy too. So I believe inadvertently, I'm also influencing um, their owner's health status. So it comes down to having the skills and their high skills. And I know so many therapists who are absolutely awesome and have these skills at their fingertips. It's about building a calm, professional bond with the dog because you want to gain their calm focus their active conscious mediation. They are going to decide themselves through what you do, through your therapeutic touch, through your key points of control, by the way you engage with your body posturing with the dog and your touch work with the dog, what they're going to do movement wise. And this is hugely proprioceptively enriching. I cannot emphasize you can do some of this and make a massive impact on the dog so quickly. So the clinical tip here is the dog's active decision. So the dog consciously mediating, not following a training technique, not following to heal, not following a tactic or a dog game. This is about they engage with you because you as a therapist give them information through tensioning, body posturing, your position, what you do with your key points of control and how you control and organize that movement shape they follow you, they choose to follow you. Canine movement enrichment techniques do this and they significantly improve the dog's day-to-day -day movement and functional tasks that they need to do. However, this is the caveat, techniques that cause a dog's behavior to shift from that calm, focused, listening, attentive, work that they're doing with you quietly, the small bits of work that are hugely proprioceptively enriching for the dog. If you over challenge the dog's behavior and they move into flight, fright, fool around, being evasive, being over enthusiastic, freezing, going to shut down, being reactive, they're not going to improve in the long term. This is about the dog having to get through what you throw at it through that experience or survive that event. And that isn't conscious mediation. That's another part of the brain that the dog will move into. So it's about always setting your dog up to achieve, always working and acknowledging their signaling, their feedback signals and working with the dog and having their consent rather than feeling you have to do a technique on them because everybody else is doing it, but you can see the dog kind of freezes, isn't really engaging. You can see the, the feedback signals on their face that they're just getting through this because they love their owner and they don't really want to do this. It's not a place they want to be in that won't have very much proprioceptive value for the dog in the long term. So I know this might be difficult for some people, but seriously, after 25 years, please, let's look beyond the wobble cushion, beyond the wobble board, beyond a peanut, a surfboard, suggesting that wobbling a dog will help them walk. is such It's such a small bit of information out of this huge complex jigsaw that people are taking and not really understanding the consequences of those decisions. So this is about your practice ethos. Go back to where are you? If you're all about the dog and work with the dog with their consent, this is for you. If you don't believe that and feel it's fine to use painful treatment techniques and you're just going to do, you know, whatever it comes to get the dog to improve or you don't mind working outside the biomechanical model and causing a much higher incident of injury, 
Um, you know, that that's not my audience. That's not my community. And I, and I respect you've got different choices, but I'm not going to work outside that biomechanical model knowing that I'm going to have a very high incidence of issues with the soft tissues that can't cope with that excessive force. So this is about advancing your practice and choosing techniques that map directly into canine bi biomechanics, into the neural arrangement of their CPGs, totally different to humans, into their canine proprioceptive system, which is wired differently to humans, and into their muscle memory. And so techniques which initiate that conscious, mediated, static, and dynamic sequencing in the dog in natural balance stance and motion, and you tune it up for each dog you see, because every dog is so different and every owner is so different, and each session is different. And if you're gonna retune that up, so much more effective, and you're going to achieve the most awesome results rapidly. So in summary, thank you so much to Richard Bentham for letting me use um, his brain map. I really love it, his mind map that he designed again for the proprioceptive system it's there for you if you want to come back and revisit this link and have a look at it and Richard again did the level five advanced canine hydrotherapy and, and he produced this as part of his work um, and it, I, I love it I love the colors your brain learns better in colors I love brain maps I love spider diagrams I'm really dyslexic so for me reading script is tricky um, and I have to thrash my way through it. But once I see a brain map, it makes sense. So again, creating your own brain map with this information and start thinking about you know, what you are doing, why you're doing it, reflect on it, is so useful for your practice to advance your practice. Every day is a school day. We learn something new every day. I've had the most awesome week back in clinic and we've learned so much working with the dogs in our care and, and I've missed working with them so much. So we've only just opened, reopened. So let's get back to proprioceptive active movements and therapy. Proprioception is the neural feedback mechanism in the body. It's really important in organizing sequences of movement. It's really important for efficient coordination and balance in the dog. It's also incredibly useful to use proactively to prevent um, injuries or to minimize injuries, which is really important in the athletic dog and the working dog. So choosing proprioceptive exercises which integrate into your biomechanics, behavior, and functional anatomy of the dog are excellent um, in achieving effective rehabilitation or to see progress. These techniques are adaptable, and that's what I love. It's the concept that we're going through. So when you look at the technique, you can adapt it for the elderly dog, the seriously senior dog who I adore, who's going off their back end. We can make such a big difference using these. And you can make a huge difference and give the edge to your athletic dog or your working dog. You can, um, after rehabilitation or injury or surgery, you can use these concepts to really get the dog back on track and optimize and get them to be their best version of them. So it's about the concepts and it's building the techniques so you understand the why of your choices. The key is active, consciously mediated movements are significantly more functionally relevant than passive movements. They have the much, much, much higher proprioceptive value. Proprioceptive value is what it's all about. Achieving a great result in as short a time as possible. Building a professional bond with each dog so you've got their mindful focus and their calm self in your clinic and you're responsive to their ongoing feedback signals you're going to see in a clinical environment is always going to achieve the best results every time. So let's look at the why of your exercise treatment choices. And I'm just looking at the time, I've really run over and I do apologize, but so much to pack in, but I wanted you to preview a library resource. This is a typical library resource. This one page is one resource and we're adding one every fortnight and we've got 50 hours of resources sitting in our library all ready for you to access. So for each dog, establish your SMART goals. SMART goals are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and timely. These are clinically reasoned, and you're gonna look at your exercise techniques as part of your overall treatment technique, where it fits in. So you're using these proprioceptive enriched exercises to raise the quality and the efficiency of the motor sequencing and motor patterning. 
You're going to effectively manage um, pain perception. So you're going to have pain relief as part of that multimodal pain management plan. The dog is designed to be efficient. Let it be in its best place. So you're going to optimize dynamic joint stability. So important for the dog and also their joint mobility. We're going to improve joint range of motion. But remember, in the elderly dog, in the senior dog, the mid range of motion is their functional range of motion. So you're going to improve their mid range of motion. You're not going to push a senior dog into end range of motion if it's not been there for years because you will take the dog off its legs. It will get so stiff. So you've got to make sure that each one of these goals maps directly into the signalment and the role of each dog. So whereas with the athletic dog, we must have full range of motion of the joints, the key, all the joints, the key joints. So understanding how to work with that joint range of motion, you know, well-intentioned techniques must be safe. That's the bottom line. And then if you can make them proprioceptively highly valuable, that's even better. Optimize that muscle and soft tissue extensibility. And we want to strengthen muscle and soft tissue. And remember, strengthening programs must follow um, extensibility and flexibility of joints and muscle and soft tissue. You can't strengthen at the beginning. It doesn't work like that. It's a short journey to a disaster. We want to improve our balance and coordination, increase the cardiovascular system, um, fitness in the dogs. We want to raise performance in the athletic dog and the working dog and prevent injuries. And overall, we want to improve the mental well-being of the dogs that we see. So therapists who choose to utilize treatment techniques and mindful canine exercises that work with the dog in a holistic and relevant way, we are, you're gonna achieve the most amazing results. You're going to just, it's gonna blow your mind. These are proactive, long lasting, and they lead to happy, healthy dogs being their very best version. So if you share our ethos and that's interesting you and you want to explore them more, there's some information about the courses at the bottom of the page. But I just want to say thank you so much for the most amazing sign up and your feedback and your emails and your support. We have worked incredibly hard to produce this library so it's accessible online. And we've tried to use our time where we've been shut to be very productive because it's such a hard time worldwide for so many people. And that's why we're gonna continue doing these free events. So if you like these free events and they work for you and you want some more, please fill out the poll. And I would like to invite you to buy us a coffee. And basically here's a link that takes you to buy us, a, you can buy me one coffee, you can buy us three coffees. It's three pounds or five pounds, we use our coffee money to produce the next free resource. They take three to five days to produce with all the videoing. So your, your coffee money really counts for the dogs and we want to keep doing this, but it's a balance of what we can fit in. If you want to see the replay or you want to go and see some more of the bite-sized canine anatomy, please check out our YouTube channel. So the resource library, it's new, it's gonna be launched um, literally, it was launched the last few days. A couple of people have found it before we've officially launched it, which is absolutely awesome. It's packed full of approved CPD resources like this one. So this is one page you can always have access to. So it's a free resource. It sits out in the public. You've got the link. You can come back to it. These pages are awesome because they're like Harry Potter pages. So we add to them. We can change things. They're a live page. So, so much better than PDFs and, you know, PowerPoints. It's just, and it's interactive. We've got live links on the page and we can add to them. So our next library event is our bite-sized canine anatomy. It's within the library. And we're going to look at the canine sacroiliac joint. And I've got so many one shots to share with you on that. And that's on the 13th of September at 7 p.m. and you book your spot for the library events on the library notice board in the library space. And what we've basically done is we've put five integrated canine bite-sized resource hubs. Um, it's all about the dog. You can easily access them from wherever you are worldwide. And, um, you know, please have a look at them, see if it interests you and fill out the poll as well and let me know um, whether you're interested for another free event, whether you would like a free event as a bite-sized canine anatomy, if you'd like another cl clinical techniques 
um, bite size, let us know what you'd like or email me if you've got other ideas at info at caninehscourses.com. And yeah, it's just been awesome. I do, oh, I've got a question. Here I am just about to sign off. I've got one question. Barbara. Okay, so I'm just going to, if you don't upvote it in any way, I'm just going to start answering. So I've time stamped it. Barbara, read proprioception being turned on. My L2, L5, hemilaminectomy dachshund, who is about five weeks post-op. Today, the owner was all excited as Florence is wagging her tail. However, she seems to be wagging it pretty much all of the time. Is this the pathways reconnecting or are the messages being passed by an incorrect route? You know, that is such a brilliant question, Jeanette. PM me, let's chat about that and book. We're going to book because you're a NERVAP member and an ICH member, which is the Institute of Canine Hydrotherapists. We will book an open office hour um, appointment and talk about that, Jeanette, because that is detailed. And as a neuro veterinary physio and a neuro um, human physio and understanding the differences, I really want to make sure I give you the right information and go through a little bit more information before I pass that out. But thank you. That's such a good um, question to raise. And, and I come across that a lot as well. So I don't, I'm just going to have a quick look at the poll. Please let us know if you've enjoyed this session. I can't seem to open the poll for some reason. So I'll have a look at that later. I'm so sorry I've run over. Um, it's just been brilliant. I've really enjoyed it. I hope you find the library interesting. Please take a little look and let us know what you think. And I'm going to say goodbye from um, Sarah and myself. Thank you, Sarah, for supporting me.